So I guess I have two broad topics that I'd propose we explore. One is assessment. So I think we've heard a lot of data by anecdote about sort of cherry picked examples of choosing from results to support particular points of view. And I'll, I'll, I'll grant you that we're in kind of an exploratory phase here, but I don't think it's too early for us to really ask ourselves what kind of success metrics are we gonna bring to bear? And just kind of going down the line, I'll, I'll ask the first question of the panel, and that is for the work that you're undertaking, how are you gonna gauge whether the generative AI methodologies that are being brought to bear here are successful, whether they're sustainable, whether they're cost effective, are we actually meeting genuine need or is this just a hammer looking for a nail all over the place? So, what's the answer? Um, I guess uh, I'll reflect on, on, on one of our use cases. Um, we help uh, like a help desk system and we're lucky there that the basically the that help desk admins and maintainers once they're they, the the AI recommends an answer for them to give to the user who needs help, and uh, then they can modify or edit that um, that answer and then send it on forward. Um, and so if you're in one of these scenarios where you have help desks uh, like like maintainers or admins that are modifying this information, then you can actually look at how often they're modifying it, how much they're modifying it and uh, how close your answers are to the final answers, and then uh, evaluate if it's worth their time to then look at these AIs or if they're just creating this needless busy work of, of editing around. So then my follow-up question is, do you anticipate a constant institutional dollar investment with enhanced productivity or same level of service to customers, fewer people being hired, and a bunch of people being laid off? I'm not quite sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, assessment on our side looks like, so we, we fully intend on doing a comparative analysis. We take a group of people that use this chatbot to flag transients that might be interesting for their use cases. We take another uh, control group that do it the traditional ways using these um, dashboards, and we see what events get flagged, what events fall through the cracks. Um, and use that as a basis to actually be able to quantify what gets changed when you're switching from one um, of these assessments to another. And do you feel like you have an obligation to publish the outcome of that exercise? Or is it just for internal use only? Yeah, so I think it would be useful for the community to be able to eventually publish the, these results. Our data is sensitive and unpublished right now. So uh, I think it's kind of a game of, of simultaneous releasing of the data and the results from this type of analysis. Right now it's internal use only, but I imagine there are many, many different uh, chatbots that people are hoping to build for similar use cases. You know the definition of data mining in astronomy? The data are mine and you can't have any. So, <laughs> <laughs> That's good. And how about on the commercial side for assessment yeah. of effectiveness? Well, um, two aspects. So for the products, for the system itself, we, we do um, assessing um, by, actually the assessment is one hand to the students, but that's not the result, you know. Uh, and on the other hand, we do assessment of how the AI algorithm has been implemented into the system. So that's very, very, well, we, we need to say 100%, we kind of based on AI to to you know, develop our products and to make sure the product is productive and effective and efficiently. And for the workplace, we don't have layoffs yet, <laughs> even though uh, we, we know that we've been using AI a lot in the workplace <laughs> and for our engineers, for our algorithm scientists, um, you know, we have restructured the needs, the demands of the company, but we, we haven't really lay off any employees, but actually we are recruiting more scientists because there are some works uh, done, can be done by AI, but there are more works that need to be done by human, by a uh, very intelligent scientist. Yeah, so kind of balanced, yeah. Can I add, I also think this type of assessment that I've been describing is very far downstream. I mean, surely OpenAI is doing its own assessments of, of ChatGPT, 
and those assessments by which it evaluates its ability to score on certain tests and to answer questions that are asked of it are very different from the types of assessments yeah. that we want to do for scientific analyses downstream. So I think out of the box, these LLMs are really good to kind of fine tune for our use cases to, to get going, but we should really think about more fundamentally modifying the architecture to be able to custom assess, to be able to optimize for our own particular uh, disciplines. Throwing it open to the room. Kevin. I wanted to bring up a different side of assessment. So I've been dealing with, as you mentioned in your talk, a lot of that service work and evaluating candidates for things like graduate school. And I've been thinking about kind of the role of both the fact that a lot of people are probably using LLMs to generate statements and things. And one day we may be using them to help evaluate. Um, and so something I was sort of wondering about is whether in the assessment of, say, it's a candidate that you're going to hire or just in a classroom, whether things like oral exams and interviews are going to see a rise in importance because you can no longer judge sort of someone's ability to articulate ideas solely based on written form because you don't know how much of it was actually them. Just an idea to throw out there. Yeah, so let me let me answer my version first, and that is you're asking about the assessment of individuals in various arenas. I think that's relevant for learning assessment, for assessment of individuals in selection processes, and I think in both of those, we have used proxy assessment tools, right? I mean, the standard physics final exam gives you homework, gives you problems that look a lot like the homework problems in a finite amount of time. And we fool ourselves into thinking that your ability to solve those problems rapidly is an indirect indicator of your mastery of the material, right? And similarly, when we select individuals, be they graduate students, employees, faculty, or whatever, we look at the narrative and we use a combination of the content and the clarity of expression as proxy indicators of competence, right? So I think the fact that these tools can generate that kind of drivel pretty straightforwardly means that that proxy indicator is not as effective. Maybe it was never effective, right? But to my mind, this really incentivizes educators taking a big step back to sort of bedrock principles and really asking, what are we trying to impart? How can we assess whether people have absorbed it, yes or no? Right, so I think we need to, to rethink, and I think oral exams can play an important role there, but I'll tell you, it's in complete collision with the mindset of our current student body. A good friend of mine at the University of Hawaii taught a course for graduate students in astronomy, and it was a pretty standard old school, take the child, go to the blackboard, solve this problem kind of class. And the students simply rebelled. They literally, the entire class boycotted the class, right? No, I'm, I'm actually serious. So we have this collision now. I think there's this impending collision of that kind of assessment, which is really put an individual on the spot, is in collision with values and expectations in the student body and as universities, we need to find a way through that somehow. When it comes to the multi-step screening process of accepting people into the institutions, be it undergraduate missions, graduate missions, hiring staff, hiring faculty, to my knowledge, we don't even currently ask on applications whether generative AI was used to generate the material. So step one would be, how about if we at least ask people, did you use it and if so, to what extent? And then second question is, how do we factor that in? And I would say, for the next couple of years, we should snap up all the people who said, yes, I used it. <laughs> okay, because it's like, those are the forward-leaning people that we want. Five years from now, okay, maybe we should be more thoughtful about that. But I, but I do think you've asked a really pointed question, and I think we're already behind in adapting to this evolving reality. But that maybe my friends have better answers. Um, <clears throat> probably different point of view, different dimension. So speaking of assessment, um, if the assessment is very narrative, um, dimension we think is not accurate and in the workplace is probably we only take like 10 to 20 percent consideration of the assessment results and uh, speaking of our Squirrel AI's adaptive system because that assessment was done by multimodal 
dimensions, and there's a um, long history of the learning behavior and the data. We can see very details, ma many details of the students. I think that kind of um, assessment can be, um, you know, account for more. Yeah, so that's totally different. Um, I'm sorry, sorry, I'm saying something else about the assessment. It's totally different direction, yeah. But actually, let's gauge the room. Let's make an assessment right here now. How many people in the audience think it's ethically appropriate for prospective graduate students to use generative AI to generate application materials for graduate school? Those who think it's okay, raise your hand. Yeah. Those who think it's not okay, raise your hand. How many people think it's appropriate for prospective staff hires at universities to use generative AI in their application materials for jobs? Okay for job applications? Not okay for job applications? Okay, so predominant strong sense in the room that it's an okay thing to use in preparation of application materials. How many people think that the Department of Physics at Harvard should use generative AI to pre-screen the 1,000 plus applications that we get to our graduate program? How many people think that's not okay? <laughs> How many people abstained? The majority abstained, okay? So we're just all over the map, right? We do not have this figured out. And I think that's, that's not okay. I think it's a... Well, the, but, but what are you comparing it to? Faculty reading applications? That's not very good either. <laughs> Christoph. Um, yeah, Chris, I, I just wanted to follow up on the statement that you made about the students in terms of their interest in being orally poked with respect to the oral exams and that this big clash of the culture. Um, so I just wanted to hear a little bit the opinion um, and... I consider the oral exam as something that is really um, very fundamental. It's um, a very good representation for many, many things that actually a physicist has to do. Um, let's just talk about, well, you have to give a presentation at the conference. Well, of course, you can prepare a lot what you say, but, well, there's questions and answers, and you have to be able to talk about this. Similar to, well, I go to the coffee break, and we talk among about AI, whatever we're doing, you have to be able to carry a conversation and not just say, well, I come back to you in 30 minutes. It's a back and forth where basically uh, the immediate knowledge is needed. Otherwise, uh, well, you can't really be very uh, constructive. I mean, it's, it's just not very productive in the end to, to interact that way. So could you comment on what you think or what generally the panel or anybody thinks about actually the question of whether we should give in, let's say from the teaching perspective of having an oral exam, or whether it's something that uh, uh, we want to actually uphold to make sure to kind of somehow keep some standard. I mean, where is the direction where we're going with this? Which of course also comes to evaluation. Like, I mean, you can say, make a very similar arguments for argument for a written exam. Uh, so I just wanted to hear a little bit, wh where are we there? What What is the story? And and I think um, this is a question to pretty much everybody because I struggle with this. I don't know where I put myself there. So I certainly don't have some magical answer. My My impression from talking to a lot of people is that there are a couple of factors to this. The course that I described was for first year graduate students. I think we've all had the experience that when you stand at the blackboard, your IQ drops by about 100 points, like just like that, right? So I think that a large part of the apprehension of those students, speculation on my part, is that they don't want to look foolish in front of their peers. I think by the time you get to where more advanced graduate students are doing an advancement to candidacy exam, which at our school is student plus three faculty members, that's a very different dynamic because, you know, those oral exams are meant to outline the boundary of students' knowledge, and we tell them that at the beginning. We're faculty, they're not. And I think part of that social dynamic is the peer element and how we can set people at ease that already have imposter syndrome 
and tell them it's okay to say, I don't know, right? That, you know, in fact, if I were to, if I were to just really boil all of this down to one essential thing, it would be in my dream world, our undergraduate and graduate students would take ownership of the responsibility of identifying the gaps in their knowledge and filling them for whatever it is they want to do. If you were to ask me to just distill the fundamental goal of their education, it would be that. And I think that self-assessment and acknowledgement of gaps and imperfections is a piece of intellectual growth that happens at some stage. But I think in that cohort of those students, they definitely weren't there. And how we make people comfortable with that, I think, I think yeah, I'll, I'll, so this is a very helpful question. It's sort of forcing me to, to say all this. I think it's incumbent upon us to make those students feel comfortable in that situation and to understand that it's an integral part of learning. Yeah. So, so maybe very quickly, it's like, to some extent, what I feel uh, is an important principle, at least to me in terms of what teaching is, is like getting people to go out of their comfort zone. That means they have to learn that, well, okay, this is what I know, I'm comfortable with this, and now there's something scary. I mean, like, and you have to kind of learn how to do this. And so I am very worried uh, if I think in this particular way about this, I'm very worried that people try to avoid this and therefore will not actually ever reach their full potential because they just don't go and they don't try and, well, um, we all know, I mean, like, okay, I talk for myself, but I, um, I probably have learned way more from my failures than I've learned from the successes that I've had. And I think that, uh, and this, the, the failures, they hurt a lot. And that's probably why you learn more. Uh, so I think that that's something that is important to impart on the students. And so I feel like that while it is uncomfortable, well, it's just really uh, to some extent, important to kind of create that situation. Maybe the oral exam, that's not the way to do it, but something. Can I just add, I, I completely agree with that. I think that if we right now were to draw a line in the sand and say that this is what AI should be able to help people to do, and this is what it really means to be a physicist, then I think we're going to be in muddy waters pretty quickly. I already know of multiple people who use ChatGPT to prepare for interviews and oral assessments and sort of think that that's kind of a domain that's inaccessible by AI, I think is, is not quite the case. But I completely agree if we treat it as another stream of information and to ask people to take accountability for synthesizing that just as you would uh, Google, right? Information from Google into a comprehensive vision and them to be able to, to find accountability for where their understanding of the material stops, I think is useful, regardless of whether you do it in an essay or in an interview. Before we get there, any other panel comments on this point? Okay, I was, I was going to make a comment into that. I think we actually have an incredible opportunity with generative AI because I think an oral exam is really important. And I think that we're actually approaching, like, you know, within two or three years, we can have a setup where a student goes into a room with a whiteboard and a camera, and there's, a, you know, a computer that will prompt them with different questions, or maybe it has voice, and they go through and do an oral exam. And we can actually have, like, beforehand, the bottleneck was the professors and faculty had to spend that same amount of time with every single student doing an oral exam. And now we can actually have an AI run oral exam. So we can have oral exams, yeah, much, much more frequently. Um, and I think, again, it's great because they can sort of adapt to people's learning, give them questions that they, you know, and this is what professors do when they're giving an oral exam. They'll, they'll try to gauge exactly what they know, give them problems that they're you know, that is sort of on the edge of what they can do. Um, but I think this is, I think with generative AI, we should look at it as like, uh, this is a really great opportunity to rethink how we can do assessments. Cause I think we can actually do assessments better now at a larger scale for less cost in terms of faculty time than we've been able to do before. Let me share one other factor with just really quick. And that is one of our colleagues in the business school introduced a generative AI entity into a Slack channel for the course, which I think is really interesting because the current interaction model with this generative AI is one-to-one, -one, whereas in the classroom, it's a many-to-many -many interaction. And I thought it would be really cool to have a sort of 
Slack channel classroom discussion that included an AI, but the overwhelming majority of the students in the class, when they chose to interact with this AI entity on Slack, did it in a private message. They weren't willing to expose their dialogue to, the, to, the, to their peers, which I think is one of the reasons that I've come around to this point of view that it's the peer level apprehension that's one of the things that we need to understand and, and take it as a real thing and figure out how to, how to address. I th Jesse, I think you're next and then we'll go here. So um, uh, my question is actually about assessment, but I'm gonna start off with something that I learned about um, when people are talking about uh, ethical framings of AI. Um, so you, if, let's say you have some AI that's making decisions either for admissions or for incarceration or something like that. I mean, there are, there are metrics that you can use to assess on kind of population level, whether you have something that's fair and you, know, you run an algorithm over and over and over again and you can see whether the distribution of outcomes are <laughs> statistically the same. But there's at least a part of the kind of ethical AI conversation about just the intrinsic randomness itself as being itself immoral. That is, if you roll the dice and you get different answers each time, that that itself is immoral, even if on the, uh, uh, the population as a whole, it's statistically the same. Um, now, that's an interesting question, whether or not there is a, an ethical uh, angle just to the intrinsic randomness itself. But when it comes to thinking about assessment, I'd like to hear your thoughts on, on, on the following. To what extent is those aspects of the outcome that are reproducible and the reproducibility of those things, that that is a metric for assessment? So if I give a, a physics analogy and I'm generating synthetic universes, synthetic you know, CMB sky maps, of course, each one is different. And I can say, well, how good is it at generating Sky maps, well, each one is different. How do I know whether it's good or not? But in physics, we would do a summary statistic like a power mm -hmm. spectrum and say, you know, the consistency with a power spectrum is one way of evaluating. So is there or is there not a way of taking assessment, distilling it down to some kind of summary and talking about the consistency of the summary as a, a, a measure of the success of an algorithm or not? Or is that also kind of naive in that it's actually the, the, the detailed pieces of the outcome more than the kind of summary statistic that we need to be evaluating? I have no idea. But I mean, I think a couple of threads there. One is pretend like AI tools are brought to bear on addressing some question. I don't think we should have the mindset that the question is asked and answered a single time. I think we should move to a mindset where we have some probability distribution of outcomes and then we do statistics on that, right? To overcome the ergodicity that's intrinsic in these things, right? It's essentially a Monte Carlo AI thing. And I think that gets us part way there. And then I think the other question is, you know, in terms of accomplishing Harvard's mission, how sensitive are we to specifically what subset of graduate school applicants we actually give admission to anyway, right? Arguably, it's moderately robust against making wrong choices. So I don't know. Yeah. Um, I, I, I was also going to add, in, in terms of reproducibility with large language models, um, certainly if you, if you are using OpenAI or any of these private um, companies, um, they make m updates all the time. So even specifying the exact version, they might be doing an update that you don't know about or anything like that. It definitely hurts your reproducibility ability. Uh, the nice part is um, if you use an open source language model that you download locally yourself, um, you can freeze the weights entirely and you can run it fully deterministically, basically. And then if, it, if one would be really, really concerned with replicating experiments and whatnot, you could even upload those weights to Hugging Face or any other tool where you'd want to upload weights. And then people who are trying to replicate what you did can download those weights and whatever framework you use to ask it and then would get um, identical results. And it's just a uh, sorry, yes, uh, I, sh I should have specified this is at, at zero temperature and with a, 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 and you, you'd have to impose this on the large language model, but it would still give you good, good results. Even at zero if temperature, I, it's not fully replicable. So just in, in, let's say in the, in the case where I'm trying to say, you know, is, is your virtual help desk, is it doing a good job? And, you know, basically assessing, you know, how good is the answer? You gave the answer of saying, oh, see how much the human does in, you know, edit distance on, on the result. Um, but another thing you could do is you could ask, you know, instead of freezing the weight, saying, well, let me have some variability in the weights. To what extent actually is the answer that you get kind of robust to those small changes? And that's, that is one way that you can think about doing assessment. It may not be a good way. It may be that things that are, are uh, most robust are actually not very good in terms of performance. I guess, my, so my question was a little bit about uh, to what extent is reproducibility, even if I allow things to fluctuate, or similarity, even if I allow things to fluctuate, to what extent that is that or is that not a good way of assessing the performance of a tool? 
Right. I, I guess the final thought I'll make is that if we assemble a graduate admissions committee of a half dozen faculty members, we don't do the permutation experiment of cycling through different faculty members, right? So we already are failing at any kind of replicability test. I was just going to say I completely understand that that discomfort with the stochasticity and the result in any human-led decision you see that same inherent stochasticity exactly as Chris mentioned in a way that we're not parameterizing and trying to account for. So I think it's it's fair to be uncomfortable with it because there aren't humans underlying the variability. I think it makes sense to try and describe this in a more concrete way and then maybe hopefully that'll bleed outward and help us think more concretely about in these systems where there's so much randomness that goes into a concrete outcome like firing somebody or sending someone to jail, then how do we be able to parameterize the allowable range of variability and be able to flag a system when it goes too far? So I, I'm sorry that Damien had to leave to go back to work after his talk because he talked a lot about bias in human decisions in AI. And I'm also fascinated by the fact that, the, Chris, you started this discussion by asking a question about assessment of the AI tools. And then we spent 20 minutes talking about assessment of human beings. Mm -hmm. um, and we know, you know, your last example, of course, you, we don't, have a new admissions committee every time and do the permutation tests, and there's known bias in that that we often choose to overlook. What, how do we assess, and, and then your other comment at the beginning that, you know, what we would assess AI tools on, and you had a good list of things, and bias wasn't in it, right? And so if you suggest, if we run a, create a new statistical model or an, and we want to test it for bias, you know, statistical bias, well, how do we test, how do we assess the AI tools for bias, right? Which we put in those training sets. You know, there may be 10 million or 100 million data points for Squirrel AI, but it's a biased set, right? It's, and we don't always know what that bias is. What the AI kicks out is going to reflect those biases, and Damien's talk illustrated that. But we know this for 50 years, for 70 years in computer intelligence systems. How do we deal with that? How do we assess that? How do we recognize that in these, in these generative AIs? We can barely recognize it in our own activities. So that's a big domain of research in computer science, is both on the algorithmic side and sensitivity to training sets and context. And so the one thing, so there's a whole domain of scholarship that's trying to answer that problem. Um, I'll just highlight one other point that I'd like to sensitize the audience to, and that is I think we also inject bias implicitly through the prompts that we submit, and we're doing it too. So. I think that part I would just draw to our collective attention that we'd be sensitive to. Yeah, I'd like to add, so there are research groups and companies now that you can contact to conduct AI audits of your softwares to be able to understand the various biases. They have benchmark data sets that they use to be able to compare against. And as Chris mentioned, this is an actively evolving field. Um, there is also a fledgling, um, supranational organization that is growing called the Academic Alliance for AI Policy. And their mission is to try and aggregate the opinions of academics on newly emerging technologies to be able to write kind of more balanced position papers on implications in society. Because a lot of times what you hear about these technologies are from companies that have vested interests to overinflate the positive aspects and, and not really discuss the negative implications. And so uh, if anyone is interested in being involved with that organization and, and organizing more formally, then please let me know. And oh, I think this is our last last question of the morning. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, I was just going to say that probably also begs the question that what type of a bias is uh, important, having no bias at all or having bias, but you are aware what type of a bias. So anyways, but I think the one thing that kind of uh, got me thinking is, so we are talking about assessing these tools and how good they are um, in, in teaching and learning. What I'm trying to also understand is, again, what is the end goal? Um, are we trying to, let's say, help a student or help a worker get to a certain 
level potential or are we thinking that by doing this they're gonna be geniuses so what where do we draw the line because that probably will help us also put the correct guardrails around selection processes and uh, you know candidacies and things like that so just wanted to get your thoughts on that yeah, I mean, I think clarity of objective is overall a good thing, and I think we're not as attentive to that broadly. I think this is, you know, in a way, this is kind of like COVID. You know, COVID highlighted a lot of our deficiencies in the economy and society, and I think in a way, this spotlight has kind of swung onto us, and then we're like, Ugh! and I think it similarly has, has brought into sharper focus things that were long-standing problems, and I think uh, it's incumbent upon us to fix them. Right? Yeah, I mean, going back to Christoph's point, I do agree that you have to step out of your comfort zone in order to evolve yeah. as a human and do good. So if we are really utilizing these tools, what's the guarantee that we are not going to go back to our comfort zone and never really want to evolve because we yeah. need to constantly assist yeah. us if it yeah. is a real danger. But th this, oh, sorry, did you have a point? Mm -hmm. um, this again goes back to the way some of these LLMs were trained, right? Um, based on probability distributions for next token generation, and they're really, really <laughs> eager to please, right? So um, if, if we think about kind of modifying some of these systems so that they're not as eager to be able to reinforce the beliefs, the responses that, that they're prompted by, then maybe we can start to push some of these systems in a way that doesn't keep people within their particular lines of thinking. Yep, which is where those guard rules will come in. Yep, yep, agreed. Yep. Yeah, so closing comments from my Yeah, colleagues. very, very simple answer. Actually, for because we are a commercial company, it's very easy for us to do assessment of AI tools. It's just a result. For example, the accuracy um, of the results and uh, effectiveness, the length of time the users have been uh, spent. So if the result shows very positive, which means this AI tools um, that is designed by this structure and this algorithm is effective, then we continue. We will continue to do investment. Otherwise, we will just make changes. Yeah. Uh, also, just a closing remark is that um, the, uh, to build off, there's a whole lot of work being done on AI alignment, and it's still a very open problem to try to basically make what your objective for the AI, what you think it should do, and that. Ha and uh, the difference between that and what the AI is optimizing in its math and its you know gradients and whatnot, and it's still a very open problem, and that a lot of people are trying to work. Alex, any thoughts? Mm -hmm. and final thoughts. I think right now we're in the situation that we're in because we are taking these out of the box tools that have been optimized for other purposes and trying to specialize them. Um, I, I don't have. <laughs> A lot of people don't have the time to be able to do this fundamental research on how to be able to build these things from the ground up, but I think that's really where we're gonna need to go eventually if we want these things to be optimized for the objectives that we want them to be optimized for. And I guess my closing thought would be in the poll that we took in the room, there was huge dispersion in opinions of people who are interested in this field at the overlap with STEM. And I think we need to find a way to have a convergence I think my sense is that we have to establish some kind of norms and shared expectations. And I'm hoping that meetings like this one and the organization that Alex mentioned are gonna provide a forum to do that. So my exhortation to the group is, go back to your home unit, to your home university, and start to have those conversations so that we can start to mindfully get to some kind of consensus. So let me just close by thanking speakers, including the one who's absent from the morning. And hand over to Kevin.